In my last video, Pepe II died, and the process of political fragmentation began. And in this video, we'll be discussing the period from when the Old Kingdom collapsed to when Montu Hotep reunited Egypt and the Middle Kingdom began. This era is called the First Intermediate Period. Now, Egyptians back then never called it that. This term is used by scholars to highlight this fragmented time, this dark age. And this can be perceived as a bad thing, or it can be perceived as the way Egypt is or was when it's not united under a strong leader. Remember, Egypt was divided up into these 42 gnomes before Narmer, the first pharaoh of Egypt, united all of them in the 31st century BCE. So it can be argued that Egypt wasn't falling apart, rather it was settling back into its previous order, before a smiting military leader took control and built a dynastic rule that set a precedent for crazy self-indulgent things. And as the first intermediate period began and gnomes were settling back into this previous order, it didn't fragment completely. Rather, some gnomes would group together by geography. For instance, the three southernmost provinces formed a natural economic unit, as did the next two gnomes downriver. And this economic partnership amongst various clusters of gnomes continued all the way to the Mediterranean. Now, these clusters of gnomes, these economic units, were sufficient to a degree, but natural clashes between them would occur, especially since all of them had one river to share, the Nile. If too much water was diverted for irrigation upriver, it could negatively affect food production downriver. So coordination between all of these gnomes seemed advantageous for all. And this brings us back full circle, because these natural clashes would precipitate a need for a strong ruler to coordinate order, like irrigation policies, to maximize food production, as well as the general well-being for all Egyptians. So that's really what was happening during this first intermediate period. The gnomes fragmented, and organized themselves into smaller economic units, and the most powerful nomarchs of this time were all vying to be the next great pharaoh of Egypt. Or that's what we think happened during this period. As I said earlier, this wasn't just a fragmented period, but it was also a dark age, which means few historical records. So scholars reconstruct this period by using various kings lists, lamentation literature from the Middle Kingdom, and accounts from the third century BCE Egyptian priest, Manetho. Now, I know it might sound weird that scholars trust the assessment of a priest that lived 1800 years after these events, but it seems like scholars take his account seriously for two main reasons. One is that Manetho was an insider, an Egyptian priest to the Pharaoh Ptolemy II during the Greek era of Egypt. So it's reasonable to believe that his account can be trusted to a degree when it comes to how the ancient Egyptians viewed their history. It would be like today if I cited the Pope on the history of Christianity. Of course, the Pope wasn't there when Jesus was preaching in Galilee, but he can explain how the Catholic Church views the life of Jesus as well as every major Christian event since then, albeit with a Christian bias. Another reason why scholars consider Manetho's account is that when Egyptian hieroglyphs were deciphered in the 19th century CE, a lot of what Manetho said was corroborated by Egyptian texts. So scholars will consider his account with caution when all other evidence and analysis fail to provide insight. Now, according to Manetho, after Pepe II died, who was the last king of the 6th dynasty, there was the 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th dynasties, all in a neat succession. But in reality, these dynasties either overlapped or did not exist. For instance, the 7th dynasty is said to have had 70 kings in 70 days. But these days, scholars don't believe that the 7th dynasty even existed. Rather, they see this more as a confirmation of a turbulent time, when there is both a series of unstable reigns as well as multiple nomarchs, all claiming to be the pharaoh all at the same time. Today, as scholars assess new evidence against Manetho's neatly outlined dynasties, they say that the 8th dynasty, not the 7th, began immediately after Pepe II's reign with his son. And scholars like Toby Wilkinson say that the 8th dynasty consisted of 18 ephemeral kings, emphasizing that they all had short, unstable reigns, which included a king that built a 103-foot pyramid and maybe a queen who reigned for a bit, and there was also a bunch of kings that all had Nefer at the beginning of their name. And I haven't discovered too much about these Nefers, and the little that I have seems dull. But one interesting fact, to me anyways, is that Nefer can mean beauty, good, or happy. This stood out to me because the most famous Nefer is Queen Nefertiti, the beautiful one, and her bust is one of the most famous Egyptian artifacts. She was the wife of the pharaoh Akhenaten, the pharaoh that turned Egypt upside down by worshipping only one god. And this is an important event in history because scholars speculate if this was the world's first attempt at monotheism. Unfortunately, I'm getting ahead of myself, though, because all that happened in the 14th century BCE. So we'll discuss that and Nefertiti more when we get to Egypt's new kingdom. Now, all these Nefer pharaohs of the first intermediate period may or may not have been good, happy, or beautiful. 
more likely these kings attached themselves to terms like this so their subjects would hopefully perceive them that way and support them. Now these Nefers are believed to have ruled from Memphis. If you remember, Memphis was the nation's first capital that was created by Narmer after he united all of Egypt, and it remained the seat of power ever since. But most scholars believe that the Nefers weren't ruling all of Egypt from there. Rather, they were sharing power with nomarchs from other regions, such as Heracleopolis and Thebes, which were both becoming more powerful than Memphis. And when the last Nefer died, the Memphis dynasties would collapse completely. This collapse is significant, not just because Egypt was fragmenting, but also because the historical records that were there were lost during this collapse. Information about the old kingdom and the pyramids were probably there, but now are either destroyed or buried. Any excavations in Memphis are difficult because of its high water table. Papyrus more easily rots there, and archeologists can only dig so deep before they're inundated with water. As a result, Memphis is considered to be a lost city. And once Memphis collapsed, we entered the time of the 9th, 10th, and 11th dynasties, and all three of these dynasties seem to have overlapped. As Susan Bauer put it, it was a time when unruly sets of warlords were fighting each other for the right to claim nominal control over Egypt, while other nomarchs went on doing as they pleased. And these nomarchs, or I guess warlords at this point, would give themselves grand titles like the great overlords of gnomes, and the beginning and peak of mankind. One of these rulers was Kedi I, who ruled from Heracleopolis. And in his failed attempt to conquer all of Egypt, he is remembered as being a cruel ruler who liked to hurt people. Manetho says that in the end, Kedi was eaten by a crocodile, which for ancient Egyptians is a symbol of divine vengeance. A few other nomarchs were the Inpefs of the 11th dynasty, and they all ruled from Thebes. And they all had names like the King of Upper and Lower Egypt, makes peace with the two lands, and the beautiful and the strong champion. In reality, these were just powerful nomarchs fighting other nomarchs, but never were able to subdue and stabilize all of Egypt. And finally, we come to the man who actually did reunite Egypt, Mantuhotep II, and he is considered to be the Narmer of the Middle Kingdom. Mantuhotep, like the Intefs, was both from Thebes and was part of the 11th dynasty. If we break down Mantuhotep's name, we have Mantu, which means the god of war, and we have Hotep, which means is pleased. So his name is the god of war is pleased. But he also gave himself a Horus name early in his reign, before he had conquered all of Egypt. If you remember from my last videos, pharaohs are considered to be Horus on Earth, which is represented by the falcon, and this means that the pharaoh has a divine right to rule over all of Egypt. And by giving himself a Horus name, it's believed he's trying to reassert the idea of divine kingship that had defined the monarchy and the culture of the Old Kingdom, but had since been lost during this intermediate period. Keep in mind that Khufu's Great Pyramid of Giza was already 500 years old at this point. So Mantuhotep, just like the other nomarchs vying for power, was appealing to this greatness of the past that all Egyptians seem to have revered. So Mantuhotep's first Horus name was Sankib Tawe, which translates to the one who brings life to the heart of the two lands. The two lands, of course, being Upper and Lower Egypt. Then, as he got closer to conquering Egypt, he changed his Horus name to Netjeri Hedjet, which means Divine of the White Crown. The White Crown represents Upper Egypt in the south, opposed to the Red Crown of Lower Egypt in the north. And to me, this seemed like Mantu Hotep was trying to evoke Narmer here, because both would conquer Egypt from south to north. And as he fulfilled his destiny and conquered all of Egypt, he gave himself a third Horus name, Sema Tawe, which means the one who unites the two lands. At last, a conqueror who can rightfully claim the title, rather than project and pretend something that he wasn't. He ruled for 50 years, but spent the first 40 years of his reign fighting to subdue all of Egypt, and only 10 years actually ruling over all of Egypt. He spent 80% of his reign fighting and conquering, so yes, he definitely earned the title Mantuhotep, the god of war is pleased. He established Thebes as the new national capital, and prominent Thebians were appointed to all major offices of the state, and the Middle Kingdom was stabilized. Now, most of my sources say the Middle Kingdom was established sometime between 2050 and 2010 BCE, and all of them happened during the 21st century BCE. So if you're following this project and building your effective timeline like a good student of history, you know that this event is perfect for this century. So that's it, our 12th date. 21st century BCE, Matuhotep reunites Egypt. Only 41 dates to go. In our next video, we're back in Mesopotamia. And as we enter this new millennium, we'll see a new group of people enter the scene. If you have any questions or know a lot already, in the comment section, please post anything you think is essential to understanding this century or this topic. If you're adding new information, please cite your sources. I'll be monitoring what's going on. And in my conclusion videos to this project, 
I'll highlight how we've expanded its historiography and list any questions that seem to be left unanswered. At that point, we'll have a stronger foundation for my next project and all future projects. And of course, if you're an expert and you want to share your knowledge to help guide us, please feel free to join the conversation. Or if you're interested, I'd love to interview you and post it right here. So contact me. If you just found me for the first time and are curious what this is all about, go check out my intro videos to both this project and this channel. And as always, subscribe, like, donate some money to keep the show going, click the notification so you know when the next video is up, and I'll see you then.